Work begins on establishing Central Aviation Coordinating Committee. Mendy unrest investigators being threatened. And Treasurer says the economy recovering slowly. This is the National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thanks for joining us for Friday's news. An investigation into the 2017 plane crash in the Marba province has prompted the Civil Aviation Minister to issue directives to establish a central coordinating body for aviation rescue and recovery operations. The crash involving a Britain Norman Islander belonging to North Coast Aviation happened in December last year. The investigation found that the country does not have a central system for rescue and recovery. This was one of the last flights done by Australian pilot David Tong into the Kabum district of the Morobi province. There's, this is kind of late in the season, earlier. This was a regular route for the 34-year-old who'd come to know the terrain and the risks very well. But two days before Christmas in 2017, David was on his way across the Sarawagad Ranges when he encountered some difficulty and crashed into the rugged terrain. So the investigation went into the aircraft, the engine, the fuel system. Uh, we looked at the weather, the terrain, the training of the pilot. Uh, we even conducted a, uh, and a, had a, an autopsy conducted for medical impairment. Uh, and then we went into the aviation systems how the aviation system is working and how it may have affected the safety of the flight and uh, afterwards the safety of the pilot, uh, which that, that included um, search and rescue as well. David survived the crash initially and was able to contact Nadzap Airport in Leh and provide his location. North Coast Aviation also informed authorities of the plane's location, but it took more than three days before a rescue team reached the site. By then, David had already died of his injuries. Uh, we found that there was, uh, whilst there was a coordination of activities for the search, it was not in accordance with the international standards required uh, by every country in the world, uh, set by uh, ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, in accordance with uh, Annex 12. Early this week, the Accidents Investigation Commission released the investigation report. The commission also highlighted one glaring point. Papua New Guinea didn't have a coordinating body for rescue and recovery, despite signing up to international agreements. On the uh, 18th of April this year, the Accident Investigation Commission uh, released a recommendation or issued a recommendation to the Minister for Civil Aviation uh, calling on him to establish a uh, search and rescue coordination centre uh, that complies with the international standards. While rescues have been conducted previously, there has never been a specific centre to cater for aviation rescue. I commend the Minister for Civil Aviation, Honourable Alfred Manasse, for taking a decisive action in um, specifically directing compliance with the IKO Annex 12. But the decision has come after the loss of many, many lives. Scott Wade, National MTV News, Lay. Morbis Chairman for Lands and Physical Planning Thomas Pelika told MTV News in Lay that the delay in endorsing the new members of the board by the Provincial Executive Council is taking too long. Morbe currently doesn't have an official physical planning board. It has been like that since 2015. Morbe Governor Ginson Saunu said new members of the board will be endorsed once funding is available. And people will come the chairman of Morbe's Lands and Physical Planning Board and member for Menyamia, Thomas Pelika, said the process involved in swearing in new board members has taken too long. New members of the board have been appointed by the Provincial Executive Council and are yet to be endorsed. The delay resulted in reports raised by the public in lay concerning breaches of regulations by various businesses and lack of enforcement by authorities. I've been sitting for one year, not doing anything. Now, one year, I'm September, back across September now. So after you know, August, next month, by September now. So I've done nothing. Morbe currently doesn't have a lands and physical planning board. It has been like this since 2015. 
Businesses have been established in Lay City and some are operating without following the government's requirements and regulations. In April this year, Lay City Council's health division closed a sausage factory, a foreign-owned company operating in a commercial zone near a residential area at Two Mile. Now me like my board blame me in place. So when my board in place, we'll get to the bottom of it. Earlier this week, Lay City Council's health division team again closed Lipo factory, trading a Sunny Food Company Limited located at a compound near the Bumbu River in Lay. The foreign-owned company makes fruit juice and distributes to wholesales and then to retail shops. It was reported that Sunny Limited was operating with incomplete documents that were approved by Lens and Physical Planning and Building Board to operate. The location of a factory is not supposed to be there. It's supposed to be in the industrial uh, area, one. Two, the manner in which they are employing the uh, Papua New Guineans, it's not on permanent uh, a status but on, on casual basis so that is why when you go into that factory you will see those you know especially you know uh, physical appearance of our fellow Papua New Guineans are not that to the standard of the factory so you know they are using the uh, Papua New Guineans as a cheap labor that's what I can uh, say so there is no permanent employees there is no quality uh, uh, control officer checking all the products coming out and all this so uh, we as a health authority, we are a bit more concerned and we are therefore, we, 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 we close down the factory. According to the Physical Planning Act 1989, approving authorities such as Lens, Physical Planning Board and Building Board are supposed to assess business building plans before the city authority issues licenses. Julie Badui Owa, National MTV News, Lay. Investigations into the Mandy riot and arson in June are progressing with more arrests. Police Commissioner Gary Baki says initial crime scenes have increased twofold. Despite the progress into the case, Commissioner Baki urged all leaders in Southern Highlands to assist police and charge those responsible. Speaking at police headquarters in Port Moresby, the Polish Commissioner told the media the investigation is progressing. Seven arrests have been made with each suspect charged with nine counts of arson and act of violence. Baki says more arrests will be made. 14 people have been, 14 people have been arrested. There is an additional seven that are also being arrested. And there will be more arrests uh, that will be made um, with regards to uh, the incident. A group of policemen from different parts of the country are carrying out the investigations. This includes matters of the banning of the Enigini aircraft, violence in Mendy Town and destruction to the courthouse and governor's residence. The head of police says charges will be laid, however all matters will be held in Mount Agen. Our biggest uh, challenge now is the fact that because Mendy does not have a, a courthouse, uh, we are getting these people arrested and having them transported to Mount Hagen, where they will be kept in there and the court proceedings will take place. Uh, in Hagen. Meanwhile, Commissioner Baki urged all leaders from all levels of government to help police complete the investigations. Baki says so far the investigations are progressing smoothly. I am calling on the leaders of Southern Islands, every, every political leader of Southern Islands, every councillor, every village leader in Mendy and the rest of Southern Islands to support the police in the course of the investigations and at the same time to ensure that those that have been harbored are uh, brought before the police to, you know, to, uh, to support us in our investigations. And if they, there is sufficient evidence to have them arrested and charged, then we will have them arrested and charged. If not, then as part of the investigations, we make note of that and they'll be released back to the community. Jack LaPava, Jr., National MTV News. While the investigation into the Mendy unrest moves ahead, police have also received threats from relatives of the suspects and those arrested in Mendy. Police Commissioner Gary Baki says police are not intimidated by the threats and will step up security measures for the investigation team. Commissioner Baki says the threats will not be taken lightly and this will not deter investigations. So that is also an issue. Uh, but I think uh, I'd like to say here, Commissioner of Police, that uh, nothing will stop the police from doing its work, despite the fact that it's a threat being leveled against our men. We will take every precaution necessary to ensure that 
the investigation is completed uh, you know, at the earliest uh, so that we deal with those ones that have been arrested and taken to court and allow the court process to take its, uh, its course. And uh, you know, at the end, if they are convicted, they are convicted. Villagers living along the Kikiri Road in Gona, or a province, are desperately asking the government to seal the long-neglected road. In the wake of the Cyclone Guba aftermath, the road was one of the few points of access to Popandeta and the rest of the province, while most other coastal roads were severely obstructed. Despite this, the road has received little to no attention. In the decades leading up to Cyclone Guba, the Kikiri Road was a long forgotten and neglected road. The road is one of the main arteries of the Oro province and connects the town of Popendeta to Holy Cross Station and onto the Kikiri Beach, where people from the northern coast of the province can commute to their villages. The years haven't been too kind to the road. Obvious wear and tear and a lack of maintenance have left the road in the disastrous state that it is in today. One PMB owner describes the road's neglect as stepping into a metaphorical time machine, wherein while the rest of the province's infrastructure is developed and getting the attention it deserves, the Kikiri Road remains undeveloped and forgotten. With the road conditions, uh, the road has been so bad since the time I came home. Uh, got this PMB for myself and started running it. Um, Several times community members and ourselves, PMB operators, have made attempts to try and fill potholes uh, at our own expense and with our own resources. We've tried to do that. Uh, we, we've looked for means and ways to try and get in touch with the leaders to try and uh, assist us with the road conditions and all that. But so far, I've been here homes for nearly five years now. and. The road has been just like this all this time. The Kikiri Road falls under the mandate of the Ijivitari district, represented in parliament by Richard Masere since the 2017 elections. Formerly, David Aurora served as member for Ijivitari for almost a decade. I had discussions with one of the construction company, civil construction companies, um, on Saturday. We'll be taking a drive down to Ghana, have a look at the road. Uh, we're also going down to have a look at the road in Kausada. Uh, to put in place a plan and, and I'm hoping that within the next month or so uh, he's going to go down and start grading those roads to uh, open them up for, for public usage. Um, we've also just recently completed the Buna Road, the Sanananda Road and the Sewa, Sewa Road. So there are little things we are doing but our biggest problem on the impediment is funding. But there are business communities in Oro that are willing to work in collaboration with districts on the conditions that they know that the leaders that are there are honest, accountable and transparent and whatever we sign or commit to, we are able to uh, deliver on those promises. Only time will tell if the road will be fixed. However, time and money isn't a luxury that villages along this road have. Leanne Girari, National MTV News. After weeks of being bombarded in Parliament over the economic outlook of the country, Treasurer Charles Abel presented the 2018 Media Economic Fiscal Outlook today. Minister Abel says despite hiccups like the devastating earthquake, the economy is slowly recovering and on track. According to the report, the economic outlook climbs from 3.7 to 3.9 percent due to improved production performance in the mining and petroleum sector. Treasurer and Deputy Prime Minister Charles Abel gave a rundown of the economic outlook this morning. He says the economy is recovering and made a bold statement that the government is committed to meet its obligations under the Fiscal Responsibility Act. So it's been quite conservative in terms of what is published in the mindful, but there's a potential for it to improve further. But it's not just that. As I said, it's the other work that has been done. Um, because mineral and petroleum taxes are recovering slowly, but there's been significant improvement in general tax collections. According to the Treasurer, the report is positive and the government is confident of its commitments in the 2018 national budget. Minister Abel says a notable focus will be payroll management in the public sector, revenue side reform and rollover risk to support foreign exchange. And we want to go back to balanced budget. That's our intention because that's responsible financing. And with this country and the wealth we have, if we sort the tax system out and we structure our project agreements properly, 
we shouldn't have to borrow, quite frankly. We should have enough money that why do we want to borrow and pay interest when we don't have to? The MYEFO report 2018 states the revenue collection is at 44% and the expenditure reduced from 2.4% to negative 1.6. Public debt is at 24.3 billion, which is 29.8% of GDP. Abel says the economy is on track. We expect to meet the commitments in the 2018 uh, budget fully. We're going to continue to focus on driving these revenue reforms. We have a big debt restructuring program going on to get the cost of our borrowings down and to restructure so we have cheaper longer term debt, which of course in involves more overseas borrowing to, re to restructure. At the moment we've got about 60% in our debt portfolio of 24, 25 billion. About 60% of it is domestic debt and 40% is uh, foreign denominated and we want to take it more towards a 50-50 type uh, balancing. From the report, the mining and petroleum sector has been the engine room in the revised forecast production. The department believes this has been the turning point after the earthquake. Abel says the economy is not as bad as described in the last parliament sitting. And so this kind of production rate, together with the improvement in the oil price, oil and gas price, has meant that you know, we expect to catch up a lot of that lost production. In fact, two-thirds of that production should be caught up. So what has happened is that we were going to, looking at a negative 1.6% uh, growth rate from 2.4%, it's now been revised back to 1% growth rate. So it has been that um, improvement in that sense. Jack Lapava Jr. National MTV News. This is the news on your number one to watch. We'll be back with more of the day's other stories after these messages. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the news. On the eve of the third senior officials meeting, the entirety of the APEC PNG Coordination Authority was treated to a visit by Prime Minister Peter O'Neill this morning. O'Neill praised Team PNG as they are colloquially called on the job well done hosting the previous meetings and encouraged them to continue as they represent the nation's hospitality. Wadani's International Convention Center was a colorful sight this morning as staff from the APAC PNG Coordination Authority filled the auditorium with their bright and colorful APAC uniforms, all to meet and greet with Prime Minister Peter O'Neill, who had some choice words to say to the delegation. So uh, let me uh, encourage you, I said, that we are here fully behind you. I know each one of us is under pressure, but uh, don't let anyone tell you that it is him and don't let anyone discourage you. As Papua New Guineans, we are capable of matching anybody in this world. That is why I know that we will also be very successful at that meeting. Thank you very much. God bless you. O'Neill also stated that after the APEC year is complete and the APEC PNG Coordination Authority has been disbanded, many of them could find jobs within government agencies. I have deliberately told both of Sir Charles and Chris Hopkins that many of you, especially the young, will be engaged in our foreign trade and investment area. This is a great opportunity. Many of you will be placed in many of the other departments. So if you can continue to expand on the knowledge that you will acquire. Nian Jirari, National MTV News. 24 years after Lay's first Papindo shop got burnt down, the company rebuilt and officially opened their new shopping center in Lay this morning. Managing Director Lady Susan Chandra says it was a historic moment to open this building where the company's first ever shop was built. The Papindo group of companies have been in PNG for over 40 years. With this new building, they've provided employment for over 100 new employees. This morning, up to a thousand people gathered outside Papindo's new shopping center in Lay 7th Street to witness its official opening. Security personnel and police officers were present to control anxious shoppers and onlookers. The new Papindo shopping center is five stories high with a grocery shop on the first floor and department store on the second. The third and fourth levels are yet to be completed. It's definitely been hard work and a lot of people have been waiting very patiently. Uh, and I just want to thank you to all of the 
uh, surrounding businesses who have uh, been inconvenienced by our, you know, our construction. And thank you to everybody who's been waiting. And the Papindo group of companies have been in Papua New Guinea for more than 40 years with shops in 19 centers around the country. Today, they opened this building 24 years after the first shop got burnt down here in 1994. This is the first shop that we have in this uh, location. But it burned down uh, 1994. Uh -uh. So this is the first shop that we established Papindo. The building cost approximately 50 million kina. They've also employed more than 100 staff with more expected to be recruited when the building is completed. Lucy Kopana, National MTV News, Lee. The East New Britain provincial government plans to make 150 million kina per year in the next four years. East New Britain Governor Nakikus Konga says the granting of greater autonomy to the province has put the provincial government at an advantage to retain more money than it did in previous years. Much of the income revenue will come from liquor licensing, customs checks, vehicle registrations, agriculture and hefty penalty fees for lawbreakers. Edwin Fidelis reports from Kokopo. 150 million kina may seem big money to make within just 12 months in a province that once depend on cocoa and coconut. As over the last decade, the two major cash crops have dwindled due to unstable copra prices and the cocoa port borer infestation. But the head of the province, Nakikus Konga, now calls it a change of focus. I want him to making about 100 to 150 million a year. You get to call it the province here. The provincial government hopes to tap into the untapped areas, making every penny counts. Much of the income revenue will come from the agriculture sector. The provincial government will also target big cargo ships that enter the province, random police roadblocks and vehicle registrations, also liquor licensing and a huge amount of fine for those who drink and break the law. Maybe after 10 years or so, the province itself will be sustainable, we will be completely independent. This means economy will all by your right. Governor Conga says the provincial government hopes to retain as much as 80% of the money it makes, and a significant amount of that money will go towards redeveloping the province and invest in what it had missed out on in the past. We will go to industrialization, and we have to industrialize. Maybe after five years, I will not export any more cacao, and I will force these people to process here locally, process. 100% and we only export finished products. In 2017, the East New Britain provincial government made about 29 million kina from the goods and services tax, licensing fees, commercial earnings and others. If the Conga government succeeds in achieving 150 million kina every year during its term in office, then it would have achieved more than what its predecessors achieved in previous years. Edwin Fidelis, National MTV News, Kokopo. The Internal Revenue Commission has signed a Memorandum of Understanding with the New Island Provincial Government to strengthen its relationship with the governing body. The focus of the MOU is to exchange information and enhancing goods and services tax collection. The IRC believes the MOU will pave the way for improved benefits and add value to financial autonomy for New Island. The MOU was signed in Kavieng by IRC Commissioner General Betty Palasso and Acting Provincial Administrator of New Island Province, Lamila Pawut. You're watching Friday's News. We take a look at stories making headlines overseas when we come back. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the news. Turning overseas, Zimbabwe is waking up a nation on edge and sharply divided after an election marred by claims of raging and deadly violence. Ruling leader Emerson Mangagwa has been confirmed as president. For many, it shattered hopes of a new political dawn after decades of oppression and economic hardship. After a count that lasted almost four days. Nangagwa Emerson Dambuzo of ZANU-PF party is therefore duly declared elected president of the Republic of Zimbabwe. Power will stay with the man who served the country's former repressive leader, Robert Mugabe. 
Emerson Munagagwa winning just over 50% of the votes, edging out opposition leader Nelson Chamisa's 44.3%. ZANU PF supporters celebrated as opposition party MDC left the announcement, reportedly removed by police when they rejected the result. Oh no, no, I'm not, it's fake, it's not a result. They are not credible, they are fraudulent elections. Millions hoped young pastor Nelson Chamisa would end ZANU PF's decades long rule and set Zimbabwe on a new path. Both parties declared victory straight after the vote. Six people were killed when violent clashes erupted between police and opposition protesters who accused ZANU-PF of election rigging. A concern shared by international observers too. There were some serious concerns with regards to the, uh, uh, the uh, fairness of the process. It wasn't a level playing field. There was a misuse of state resources, bias in the state media. Emerson Munagagwa has tweeted his supporters saying, I'm humbled to be elected president of the Second Republic Republic of Zimbabwe. Though we may have been divided at the polls, we are united in our dreams. But tonight, Zimbabwe is anything but united. We are protesting in the, in the streets because we are tired of these people. They have to go. They have to go, the ZANPF regime, for 38 years oppressing the people of Zimbabwe. We are tired. We are saying we are tired. Protesters vowing to fight on for change. All the most powerful U.S. security figures have combined to fire a warning shot to Russia, confirming the Kremlin is still trying to meddle in American politics. They formed a joint aggressive response. A show of force, America's intelligence chiefs lining up, denouncing fresh attempts by Moscow to meddle in U.S. elections. Our democracy itself is in the crosshairs. This threat is not going away. It is real. It is continuing, and we're doing everything we can to have a legitimate election that the American people can have trust in. Together, outlining a pervasive campaign by the Kremlin targeting the American electoral system and voters ahead of the midterms in November. Targeting U.S. officials and other U.S. persons through traditional intelligence tradecraft, criminal efforts to suppress voting and provide illegal campaign financing, cyber attacks, manipulating news stories, spreading disinformation, leveraging economic resources and escalating divisive issues. Like the 32 fake accounts removed by Facebook this week, the FBI revealing it's now sharing intelligence with tech companies in an effort to help them police their platforms. And it's set up a task force to specifically counter foreign interference. And even as we speak, we've got open investigations with a foreign influence nexus spanning field offices, FBI field offices across the country. So make no mistake, the scope of this foreign influence threat is both broad and deep. And it's not just the mainland United States. The Guardian newspaper revealing today that the U.S. Embassy in Moscow has also been infiltrated. A suspected Russian spy working there for over a decade and she had access to secret data, including the president's schedule. We will work in conjunction with other elements of our government to ensure we bring the full power of our nation to bear on any foreign power that attempts to interfere in our democratic processes. So a tough message to Moscow from America's intelligence agencies, but nothing directly yet from the commander-in-chief, who again seems reluctant to publicly criticize Vladimir Putin or the Kremlin. An experienced climber trapped on a mountain has been rescued after seven days in hostile and bad weather. The Australian soldier set off last Friday to scale a peak, but was reported missing after he failed to return on Monday. Hugs of celebration after a happy ending to a survival story no one was expecting. 29-year-old Australian soldier Terry Harch found alone in Frostbitten, now finally safe. I would describe it as a very happy ending to a situation which could have been much worse than it was. He's provided outstanding service for his country um, over a number of years. And as I said, we were just are so ecstatic to hear uh, that he's been found safe and well. Rescuers had been waiting all day for a break in the weather to reach the stranded climber. If you can't see where you're going, then you're in a very dangerous environment. It was touch and go, and we began the pilots uh, 
James and Hannibal and Snowy did fantastic work. Four search and rescue experts were dropped off near him yesterday with clothes, food and shelter. He'd been underprepared for one of the country's most challenging regions. Mount Aspiring is the dominant feature of our third biggest national park, a mixture of remote wilderness and rugged mountains between Lake Wanaka and the west coast. At more than 3,000 metres, it's known as the Matterhorn of the South for its distinctive triangular peak. Harch was spotted yesterday just north of Quarterdeck Pass, about 2,500 metres above sea level. I think the general feeling was when they got him last night, uh, they were delighted in the condition that he was. It could have been very much worse. Uh, he just said he was glad that we were here. And Experts say he may have underestimated how quickly conditions can change in the area. Your experience you've had in one location doesn't necessarily translate to the Mount Aspire National Park. When we say weather is changeable in New Zealand, it's really changeable down there. Hutch had told someone where he was going and what time he'd be back. They raised the alarm first before he set off his distress speaking. He'll be treated for mild frostbite to his hands in Dunedin Hospital, but with a more comfortable night ahead. The referee who blew the whistle on Tongan hopes that the Rugby League World Cup has announced he'll resign at the end of the season after revealing he received death threats in New Zealand. Today, the Tongan community in Auckland apologised, saying it's a bad look for Tonga. Who can forget these jubilant moments? Fans, flags and a sea of red. Unbelievable scenes. But that passion soon soured after this controversial call by Australian ref Matt Chechen. <laughs> ruling a knock-on in the dying minutes of the World Cup semi-final between England and Tonga last year. To get a phone call in the hotel saying that, you know, we're monitoring websites, there's, there've been death threats that I didn't, wasn't aware of, and to contact my family to make sure they're okay um, was was quite tough. I was actually at the corner of where the incident, the dying minute of the game. At the time I was upset because the ref didn't go upstairs. You know. There was huge reaction and even organised marches to try and overturn the decision. But the chair of the New Zealand Tongan Advisory Council, Lino Maka, is upset at today's revelation that some took their disappointment too far. I want to apologise because that's not the way the, you know, uh, uh, Tongan behave, you know. We're passionate but we're not, we're not that silly, you know, we're not, not to go that far to threaten somebody's life because of a game. It's only a game. I've done grand finals, state of origins, made plenty of boo-boos before, big mistakes, uh, and never had that. It was really, really quite, quite amazing. The Australian referee will preside over his 300th NRL game this weekend but says there won't be many more. Shukai Sports is next. Don't go away. Shukai Sports. Welcome to Chukai Sports. Two cricket and the 2018 Hebo Shield tournaments will conclude on Sunday with the grand final. The two-week competition saw four teams, Mudmen, Cassowaries, Marinas and Black Bass, play six matches so far. As of Wednesday's matches, Black Bass holds the top spot having won three matches and securing a net run rate of 0.76. While Cassowaries and Marinas, who have also won three matches each, are sitting on second and third placing as they both recorded 0.25 and 0 respectively. The results from today's playoffs will put forward confirmed sides for the finale on Sunday. To what's coming up this weekend here in Port Moresby, Muay Thai kickboxing world title defense fight between PNG's Lee Garup and U10 Chanavan will be taking place tomorrow at Sir John Guy's Indo Stadium. And National Capital Rugby Union Grand Final is happening as well tomorrow afternoon at the Sir John Guy's Stadium. True Guys Sports continues with more as to these messages. Stay tuned. True Guys Sports. Welcome back to Truk High Sports. On the eve of the big Super Rugby showdown in Christchurch, the fallout continues at the Blues with captain and all-black halfback Augustin Pulu quitting to head to Japan. Meanwhile, the Crusaders are on the brink of claiming a record ninth title, with the Lions admitting they need a miracle to defy history. 
Ryan Crossy may have a big game temperament, but will once again have to prove his worth in the final. You've got to strip it back and, and prepare again this week, and, and the boys have prepared well. There's been a bit of edge around the team, the guys. It's a final. <laughs> You'd be a bit worried if there wasn't. And while Crossy echoes cool expertise, he's been more impressed by the much younger backs who know how to keep level heads on the biggest stage. By no means am I worrying about Richie inside me or Jack outside me, mate. They're, oh, mate, they're unreal. To play at home um, in a final where we haven't played in 10 years um, is very special. The Lions haven't been at this venue for three years, but have a new belief their forwards can match the champions man for man. We'll, we'll see tomorrow night. Um, they've got a massive pack, they've got an all black pack, so it's, it's, it's going to be a tough, it's going to be a battle, but yeah, hopefully the girls will step up and, and, and match them. Their imposing forwards are expected to make most of the inroads, but out wide they've got their own excitement machine. We give them credit for what they've done so far in the season. They've been amazing, you know, they've played well. But this is now obviously a final and anything can happen in a final. It's a 50-50, so we'll see what happens. Boys be nervous, but um, I think nerves mean you're ready. And given Crotty doesn't usually let emotions get the better of him, there'll be cause to let those out if he wins back-to-back -back titles, along with the consecutive Man of the Match medal. To sevens now and three of the New Zealand men's squad have signed on until the 2020 Olympics. Tim Nicholas, Scott Curry and Joe Weber confirmed their futures during a primary school visit. From the Golden Gates of San Francisco <laughs> to a small rural Bay of Plenty school. An ideal setting to announce they've re-signed with New Zealand rugby and are eyeing up more gold at the Tokyo Olympics in two years' time. Yeah, it's, uh, it's obviously um, an awesome time for, for me personally to be able to sign through to, to the next Olympics. Um, and then for us, we can just focus on getting better as players. Co-captain Scott Curry and veteran Tim Mickelson led the team to Commonwealth Games gold, World Cup victory and third place on the World Series, which was all part of the coaching plan. We centralised. They plan to win two pinnacle events. To actually achieve it is something special and... You know, we've got the World Series next year and I think we're targeting to win that too. An extra special day for Joe Webber, his five-year-old boy never leaving his side. Yeah, uh, I always enjoy coming into uh, schools, you know, and for it, to, for it to come to my son's school is pretty special. Yeah. His season was cut short by an arthritic infection. A lot of uh, fishing. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, fishing, diving or hunting, one of the three. <laughs> After a successful few months, the team has six weeks off. What's it like? having dad here at school? Um, good. A good day for these Pangaroa students. Three, one, two, three. <laughs> and New Zealand rugby. England only has itself to blame for Indian batsman Virat Kohli single-handedly keeping them aside in the first cricket test. Kohli's been dropped twice on his way to another century while none of his teammates got past the 20s. When Virat Kohli strode to the crease on day two, there had just been a glimpse of the drama that would unfold. Auckland Aces import Sam Curran striking twice in three balls for the hosts. First a review, then this. Pulls out to the ground. And soon after, Curran had another scalp. Oh, that's gone, isn't it? Yes, it is. India 59 for three. Kohli class needed more than ever. There were signs early he would provide just that. Pleasant. But once again his teammates fell around him. This time Ajinkya Rahane and Dinesh Kartik in quick succession. Oh, wow. I'm gone. Oh. England could smell blood and a big first innings lead. Again though, just when that would have been considered an almost certainty. Oh, yes, no, down. Coley dropped for the first time on 21 so he set about making the hosts pay. Driven nicely on the up. A couple more boundaries later and he was dropped again. England's catching has been suspect. Rueful smiles on the face of the English paceman. Coley continued to lose partners at the other end, but he flicked a switch and forged on, bringing up his milestone in the final session. Pushed it away behind square and a remarkable player has adorned a remarkable day's cricket. 22nd Test 100 for Virat Kohli. The master eventually dismissed on 149, better than his previous 10 innings combined in England. India all out for 274, outside of Kohli, a highest individual score of just 26. 
His efforts rewarded when spinner Ravi Ashwin again removed Alistair Cook cheaply to leave England just 22 runs ahead. And that ends Shukai Sports. Up next, the weather details for the next 24 hours. Shukai Sports. Shukai Sports. The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux, celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. Looking at the weather forecast for this afternoon and tonight in the southern region, fine, becoming partly cloudy tonight till the morning in Port Moresby. Daru, partly cloudy with a chance of rain drizzles. In Kerama, partly cloudy with a chance of rain drizzles as well. Alata, a few showers tonight, then cloudy in the morning. And in Popandita, rain showers tonight and cloudy morning tomorrow. In the Mombasa region, overcast with rain showers and possible thunderstorms tonight, then cloudy tomorrow morning. In Medang, Wewak and Vanimo, rain showers and possible thunderstorms, then cloudy in the morning. In the New Guinea Islands region, in Loringa, a few showers tonight becoming partly cloudy in the morning. In Kaviang, mostly fine. In Kokopo and Rabaul, partly cloudy with light showers, with fine weather in the morning. In Kimbe, overcast tonight with rain showers and possible thunderstorms. And in Buka, partly cloudy with light showers. In the Highlands region, in Mount Hagen, rain showers tonight with early morning fog. In Goroka and Kundiawa, mostly fine, becoming partly cloudy. And in Mendi and Wabeg, fine, becoming partly cloudy. Forecast for small ships for the next 24 hours. Waters of southern PNG Indonesian border through Torres Strait and Daru to Kiwai Island to Kerama, to Yul Island to Hood Point to Samari Island with waters of eastern and western Mumbai Islands, including waters of Samari Island to Cape Fogol to Finchhafen, with waters of Finchhafen through Vitias and Dampier Straits to CRC Islands to Long Island with waters of Long Island to Medang, to Bogia and Wiwek, to Aitape, Banimo to northern PNG Indonesian border and with waters of West New Britain, seas of 1.5 to 2.5 metres. Waters of Manus and its western group of islands and with waters of East New Britain and to New Ireland and Bougainville, seas of 0.5 to 1.5 metres. Forecast for PNG areas in the Coral Sea. Seas rough to rather rough with southeast winds at 25 to 33 knots with gusts to 48 knots at times. In the Solomon Sea, seas moderate with southeast winds at 20 to 25 knots. In the Bismarck Sea, seas rough to very rough with southeast winds at 25 to 34 knots with stronger gusts to 48 knots. And in the Pacific Island, Pacific Ocean, rather, seas slight with southeast winds at 10 to 15 knots. The details were proudly brought to you by Dulux, celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. And that's the news, sports and weather for today, Friday the 3rd of August 2018. On behalf of the entire MTV News team, pleasant viewing and safe weekend. Good night.